Hi again, everybody. Wildlife time, my favorite, my favorite. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about techniques for photographing wildlife, which is my particular interest and happens to be my life's work as well. There are opportunities everywhere for you to practice taking pictures of all kinds of wildlife, believe it or not, from squirrels and insects in your own backyard to plants and animals of all kinds that you have to travel to them. I have a great setup for taking wildlife pictures in my own backyard, actually from my laundry room, believe it or not, seriously. Let me show you what I mean in this uh, field demo. Okay, so what I've done here is I've put a piece of camouflage cloth over my laundry room door. I have a bird feeder not 15 feet away. The birds come in there every day. I'm gonna cut a little slit in this cloth, stick my lens through and go, real simple. Okay, so I'm ready to shoot. That's all there is to it. The birds won't know I'm here. They're gonna come right in. Let the magic begin, baby. They're already on the feeder. Didn't take any time. We wanna set all this up when it's really dark out so that we get good stuff once the birds start coming in. We wanna be all set to go once it's feeding time. So we try to do everything in the dark just about, before sunrise. And then when they do come in, the light's nice and subtle, and we're golden. We're all set to go. Hey, we've already got a squirrel coming in. Already. Okay, so I'm quiet in here. I'm not moving around very much. And the wildlife's coming in really steady, just like every morning when we use our feeder out here. I've already, uh, during the day when the wildlife's not around, I've already picked my spot. The background's very nice and subtle. I put my feeder in a good place. And now stuff's coming in. I mean, literally, we've got nut hatches. Hold on a second, got nut hatches coming in. And starlings, see they're hungry and they really wanna be there and they don't even know I'm here. We've got a squirrel right on the ground. He's gonna hop up and feed right on the bird feeder and they're gonna fight with the birds and there'll be a lot of action. So hold on a second, hold on a second. A lot of house sparrows there. And how I'm deciding what to shoot, I've already decided that before I set any of this stuff up. I've already decided, you know, what this is gonna be my frame. It's gonna be this feeder, the light's gonna be subtle, the background's green and lush. There's fencing that birds can stage on. We can do layers here, we can do action. It's, it's really, really straightforward. I have a nice long lens on that enables me to blur the background and we're all set. I mean, if we have everything in place beforehand, we've thought it through a little bit, this becomes very simple and we can enjoy it, really concentrate on what's coming in, like this squirrel coming into the feeder right now. It looks like there's another one wants to push him off. As far as where I'm composing things, I'll throw things off to the side. Sometimes I'll center them. And since this is kind of a dark scene, I'm underexposing a little bit. I want it rich, I want it nice. I don't want to blow out those highlights. So usually I've got the camera set on aperture priority. It's still fairly dark. So I have a big hole in my lens. In this case, on this lens, it's 5.6. And I've got it at about 1600 ISO. And that gives me plenty of shutter speed. And so I'm using this long lens, it blurs things out. It's a 200 to 400 millimeter lens. I can back out, zoom out, zoom in. And I've thought this through before I ever sat down in this chair. I've thought this through when there wasn't pressure on, when there wasn't wildlife out there. I kind of had it all thought out already. So by the time I get here, it's just gravy and I can enjoy myself and just sit and watch if I don't want to shoot everything. So it's really nice. Okay, so a couple things that help this along big time. I have a device here called a Wimberly head. And this is a little uh, pivot head actually. It's just, it's a really nice little device that's great for wildlife shooting by the Wimberly company. They're the only ones that make it that I know of. It's just a pivot point. It's a tripod head, but it's, it's a pivot. It allows you to go side to side, up and down very, very smoothly. Very easy way to shoot things that are moving like wildlife. 
The other thing I have going on is I've got a pretty high ISO on my camera. I'm up at 1600 because the sun hasn't fully come up yet. That's often when the wildlife's the most active. So I've got it way high on my ISO. Why? Well, because I want a fast shutter speed. These birds and these squirrels are moving all over the place. I want to freeze the action with a fast shutter speed. So right now I'm wide open, big hole in the lens, F4. Got my 200 to 400 millimeter lens, F4. I've got about a 200th of a second and I'm on aperture priority, okay? And that way I'm always, sh I'm not thinking about the light as it comes up. The camera is going to think about the light for me. Kind of establish these pre parameters and that's absolutely the way to do it so you're more carefree. The other thing I do is at the start of this shoot, I chimped it. You know about chimping? Chimping's when uh, you look at the back of the camera, you look at the screen, just to make sure things are sharp and to make sure that, that uh, you're not getting any camera blur. Look at this. Right in here on this squirrel, we can zoom in. Sharp as can be, the color's good, nice and sharp. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check the histogram. Now our histogram is just a graphic display showing the information in the picture. The right is bright, remember. The right is bright. I wanna make sure I'm not touching the right. I don't wanna blow out any of the highlights. There's no detail in a blown out highlight. Most of the information's over on the left, the dark side. That's okay, because it's kind of a dark scene still. There's no direct sunlight here. So I've chimped it. I know it's sharp. I'm looking at the histogram. I know my exposure's good. Now I can relax and go. I'm just gonna shoot. We got a beautiful cardinal out there right now. How awesome is that? That is so amazing. So right out the back door of my laundry room. How easy is that? Anybody can do this, believe me. Okay, so these look great. Nothing wrong with them. Long lens, beautiful, beautiful. But I have a secret weapon right here in my pocket. Look at this. This is a radio remote trigger. This one's by a company named Pocket Wizard. They're very cheap, like a hundred bucks a piece. There's one here, one out on a camera right by the feeder, like six inches away from the birds. To take the picture, I look, make sure they're close, press the button, we just took a picture. Easy as that. And it's beautiful, it's a very new look for us, very intimate. Let's go outside and I'll show you how it looks out there. Okay, so we're out here at the feeder. We're standing right here. We've got two cameras to choose from. One's a little point and shoot. The receiver is right here on top. The little radio receiver on both cameras. This is a DSLR, a little bit different lens choices, a little bit different ISO ranges. Here's the trigger. I sit inside the house, I press the button, take the picture. That's all there is to it. So you can see what I set up there with my camouflage curtain. It's what it's called a blind or a hide. A blind is anything that conceals a photographer from the animal that he or she is trying to photograph. We just want to not let them know we're there so that they remain calm and do their thing. So now if you want to be a little farther out, you wander away from home a bit, many local wildlife sanctuaries have public blinds for wildlife watching and photography. In Nebraska, one of my favorite places to go in the spring every year is called Calamus Outfitters. It's out by Burwell, Nebraska. This is actually a working cattle ranch in central Nebraska where they have sharp-tailed grouse and prairie chickens. It's amazing. They come right up to their blinds. Believe it or not, one of their blinds is an old retired school bus that sits on a hilltop in the heart of the Sandhills. It's quite lovely. You know, I bet you could find great spots near where you live too. Check with lo local nature groups, see what kind of wildlife events happen in your area. You may be on a migratory path for monarch butterflies or hummingbirds. Is your county a nesting spot for rare birds maybe? Might be. What about uh, when insects are at their peak? Or if you're on an ocean, do you know when the shorebirds are nesting or gathering in great numbers to feed in any one place? Take this picture for example. This shot not far from my house is of the sandhill cranes migrating through the central flyway. It's an epic show. Half a million of these birds come into the Platte River each spring, many of them at the Roe Audubon Sanctuary near Gibbon. Now, how is it that I happen to be there with these birds at the perfect time? Well, obviously, I've increased my chances for getting a really good picture by researching a bit about the birds' behavior. I learned that these birds stop during March. They come in to rest up for their annu annual migratory flight from southern Texas, northern Mexico, all the way to Canada and the high Arctic to breed. They roost in the river at night and they're out in the cornfields to feed during the daytime. So I'd done my homework. I knew when to be there. You know, educational animals at zoos are also really good because the animals are right in front of you. Take advantage of how close they are and put beautiful lighting on them. There's no excuse not to if they're right in front of you. 
If you see an animal right on somebody's arm, like an owl, why would you not want to make a beautiful lyrical picture of that owl's face? Same goes for, let's say, a chameleon. Beautiful animal. Whatever that animal or zoo has to offer, take advantage of that. Educational animals are parts of most zoos' routines now, like the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Now these were all shot at the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha. Great, great zoo. Not far from where I live. Now these are shot nice and close, aren't they? Look at this, I used a macro lens on the gorilla and a long lens on those polar bears. So this is, a, this is a nice, easy place to work, very relaxed, fun place. Crown crane with a long lens. How nice is that? How easy is that? Next up, these, uh, these are Mexican gray wolves at the Sedgwick County Zoo in Wichita, another really, really fine zoo. The Mexican gray wolf is a federally endangered species. Here she's got her pups there, which is a big deal. I went there for an assignment I spent almost 40 hours with these wolves, just looking into their pen from a boardwalk, and they, had, they were in a big natural looking enclosure. These wolves were, were all really rare at the time, they still are, but this breeding program really helped them out a ton. The interaction with mom and dad was great. It was just perfect. You know, the problem here was that mom and dad would be sleeping during the hot part of the day, which was all day that summer, these animals were just active at dawn and dusk, so I had to stay there all day in case some, something happened. I had a book, and I sat near their enclosure, and I waited and waited and waited, and I guess the key is patience. I mean, I waited all day for maybe 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. Patience is absolutely key when you're a wildlife photographer. Now, uh, this one, shot at the San Diego Zoo, where they have a breeding program for the California condor, another very rare bird. This is in a big flight pen. There's a lot of wire there. How do we handle that? Using a long lens, actually, it magically takes the wire out from behind these birds. Check that out. Same pen. I was shooting through a little hatch there. The zoo gave me special access. I was with National Geographic. But that long lens, look at that. If you press it against wire, the wire in the foreground will vanish most of the times. This is because the big lenses have such shallow depth of field that if you're wide open with your aperture, you can really clean things up. Right? I like the framing device here, you know, that, that little hatch in the door. Another framing device, the primary feathers, really frame his face. He's just sunning himself, but I love that, you know, it's a nice little compositional element here. You have a hint of the wire pattern in the background, but not bad, not bad. And he's giving me a little gift, isn't he? Notice the rule of thirds, too, right? Put his face in that upper left-hand corner, right in those power points, that intersection point. Makes sense. So now. Flower pictures. A lot of us do flowers when we start out doing nature because flowers are kind of easy and that's okay. They're beautiful. They're lovely. I use a macro lens all the time when I'm doing flower pictures, constantly like everybody else, and I like to experiment with it. We know that macro lenses naturally have a very shallow depth of field if the hole in the lens or the aperture is wide open. Now, in this case, extreme shallow depth of field. There's hardly anything here that's sharp, just a couple of petals really. But I like that. I like how everything goes soft except for just right there. That's it. It's kind of like a little watercolor painting. That's okay. Now, a more conventional macro shot. I've pulled back here a little bit so the whole flower is in focus and the flower that's next to it on a parallel plane. Here's our focal plane right there. That's okay. The one on the right is called Monk's Hood. It's actually kind of a rare flower in Iowa. Now, next up, cactus flowers. Now, these are shot off of a tripod with different apertures. Look at here, we've got a shallow depth of field or a big hole in our lens, big aperture here, just to get the flower sharp and the thorns go soft, right? Okay, now watch this. A little bit more depth of field, well, a lot, actually. Here I'm using a cable release on my tripod because I want a tiny hole in my lens and that's a slow shutter speed if we're in soft light like open shade, right? The cactus isn't going anywhere. He, it, it, it's not a windy day, it's not moving around, we're using a tripod, and look at the depth of field. Everything's sharp there, even though we're very, very close. Let's use a cable release and really get a lot of depth of field if something's not going anywhere, and that's the effect we want. No reason to be scared of that at all. Now, what else? You know what? I like to do things that are moving because it's harder. I really like to challenge myself all the time. So, American goldfinches, I thought, what can I do with American goldfinches? Let's see. Oh, how about if we put them in the habitat they're supposed to be in? This is out at a little acreage I own near Lincoln. They love thistles and they love the weedy lots near acreages. And I thought, well, let's show them in the right habitat. How do we do something like this? Well, I'll tell you a little secret. 
there's a feeder right here. We feed these finches all year long. All the time they get, they get uh, thistle seed from us. So there's a feeder just out of frame. So I know they're going to land on these thistles and wait their turn. There's a big flock. That's it. That's it. Sometimes when you're out there using remotes, the animal will come in, <laughs> believe it or not, and land right on your camera waiting. So a lot of times I'll put a remote on my camera and half the fun is photographing the birds as they land right on the camera. They are not afraid. They literally land right on top of my gear. They just want access to the food. And they're very habituated. They're used to me being around. They're used to the cameras. They don't care. And that is excellent. Love it. You know, don't forget to go to your local aquarium or botanical garden too. They're all great sources of information about the natural world. And you may be able to get a, you may be able to get a picture there too. One note of caution. Be sure to never misrepresent that your photos of captive animals are wild, of course. You know, this is really doing everybody a disservice if you try to pass off captive things as wild. In all my captions, I clearly identify what's a controlled situation, what's captive, and what is truly wild. And it gets you into trouble if you go to publish. And it's also just plain wrong. So please, be really upfront with that. Put that right in your captions. In digital, that rides with those pictures all the way through, so you've done, your, you've done your duty, you've done your job there. Now, there's also traveling for wildlife pictures, which, of course, I do a lot. I go outside of my home state all the time. In fact, I'd say I spend an average of one day studying for each day I shoot in the field, one day of research at home for each day in the field, if not more. See, I want to know well in advance things like, When's the peak time to see the animals or the plants? Or how close can I get without disturbing the animals? How cold or hot will it be? Is it gonna be rainy or sunny? What's going on there? I just wanna get a good picture. The last time I went to Alaska, for example, things went very well because we had pre-planned, right? Pre-planned, certainly. Wildlife work has no guarantees, remember. But doing your research helps a lot. Really puts you in a better position. You know, the grizzly bear doesn't know or necessarily care that I'm with National Geographic, so he may or may not show up. That's true, he might not. But I know if I go to a certain place, like Denali National Park, at a certain time of the year, when all that tundra turns, turns beautiful colors, I'm more likely to see great stuff happening. It's all about improving the odds. For example, in Alaska, there's great places to go where the bears are habituated. And the bears aren't going to threaten you, really. They may look menacing, but... Other people have been there a lot taking pictures. There's safety in numbers of being with other people. These bears are used to it. And it works out just fine. It really does. Totally. So a lot of times, I'll work with animals that are habituated to people in the wild. And I don't mind that. I don't mind admitting that. In fact, I kind of prefer habituated animals because they're not going to be running away. They're going to be used to people. And I won't be harassing them. That's important to me, right? It's very important to me to be able to be close and just get these animals hanging out. I don't want to go around stressing animals, and it does me no good to get a series of butt shots of animals running away, okay? Where do we go? We go all over the place, all over the place. And I look for animals that are just really super used to people being there. How easy is this? Brooks Falls, the hardest part is getting there. The bears are wandering right around the shooting platforms. They congregate in great numbers. It's a lot of fun. It really takes your breath away. They're magnificent animals. They really are. It's something I think that everybody should go do. If you can get up to Alaska and look around up there, wow, it's really quite amazing, quite amazing. So let's talk about going to, let's say, a drive through wildlife park. This is at Fossil Rim in Texas. Zebra, wow, okay. He didn't really want to do anything much. He was just kind of standing there. Most of the time, he just showed me his rear end. And so I thought, well, instead of fighting it, let me get out the long lens and make something out of this by long lens. I mean, this one right here, 200 to 400, easy to shoot right out the car window. I did not know that certain species of zebras had stripes on their tails, but I took an opportunity. It was presented to me. He just wanted to stand with his butt to me. That's fine. I'll take a picture of a zebra butt. It's kind of cute. It works out fine. That's, that long lens really compresses things, doesn't it? It's a good way of seeing this, compressing those stripes, just a nice different way of doing it. So what gear are you going to take with you? wherever you're going to go shoot. Scout the location first if possible and see what kind of lens you're going to need. Or talk to other photographers who have been there. They'll tell you if you find somebody who's giving with information, which you should always be too, by the way, once you go. Long lenses are often a must, even if the animal's in a pen, believe it or not. We saw that with the California condor. 
If you can't get close to something, a long lens, a 200, 400, or a 400, a 500, a 600 millimeter lens, even just a 300 will be an important tool for you. You can also use a teleconverter to reach out and touch a subject a little bit more. Now, a, telephoto, a teleconverter is something that just magnifies your lens a little bit. There's a 1.4, a 2x, which doubles the focal length, just a little magnifier you put on the back of the lens. And you know what? As you get a bigger lens, bigger, 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 you might want to use a tripod to support those long lenses because they get heavy and you get a little shaky trying to hold them up. If it's dark out, you may need a tripod and a cable release to keep that camera from vibrating when you press the shutter button. So let's look at our lenses here. My standard kit for photographing wildlife varies. I've got my 1424, which is a really nice landscape lens, but you know, I've used it on wildlife too with those little remotes that I showed you in the demo. Got a, uh, what else? A macro lens, 105. I've got a 24 to 70. This is kind of my workhorse lens for people, but I use it a lot for wildlife too. And a 7200, kind of an intermediate thing. Works fine. It's nice for aerials actually, getting closer to wildlife when you can't use a big lens. And the big gun here, this 200 to 400. And this isn't that big. It's not hard to, it's not hard to carry at all. A 500 or a 600 F4, that's a really nice lens, but boy, a 600 F4 weighs about 14 pounds. That's a lot of weight, it really is. And sometimes I carry it, just depends on what I'm doing. You know, I view shooting wildlife the same way that I view shooting people. I think about getting close enough and getting repeated access to my subject. I can't stress that enough. Repeated access, that's a big deal. You know, I'll also take a flash with me. You know that small portable soft box that I used in the demo there? I use that all the time, like at Raptor Recovery, where we lit up the owl. I use that all the time if I can get close to a subject and light it. Those goldfinches, believe it or not, were lit with a little softbox, right? If it's a frog or a turtle, interesting plants, I'll take that softbox, I try to get that light right next to the subject, very, very close. The closer that flash is in that softbox, the softer the light becomes, so. I also ha always have a macro with me. Always, I never know what I'm gonna need it. Even if I'm on a story on grizzly bears, I may see a great flower or insect at my feet. Those provide great macro opportunities. Let's say all the bears are sleeping and I wanna be shooting something. They give you a chance to do something different and to see something differently. And that's very important. I like to stay busy through the day. I love to shoot, so that's just that. Insects on flowers obviously are excellent subjects for this because they, they don't really run off. A lot of times insects are really busy feeding. They're, they're hunting, they're, they're feeding on nectar. If you carefully work and don't scare them off, you can get beautiful, well-lit shots from very, very close up of insects. It's the same way with smaller critters. It is. This is blowout penstemon, a rare plant with a little, with a little insect crawling around it, feeding. What else? A spider that's, that's caught a, a little mayfly. Turtles, that's all right. Toads. Lit at night with a flashlight, this is actually a very rare toad called the Houston toad in Texas, you know? I would actually argue that the, stuff of the, that the small stuff of the world is better to photograph in many cases because you can really make that light sing. Remember, again, it's counterintuitive, but the closer your flash is to the subject, the softer your light will be. It's very counterintuitive, but it's true. With my little softbox, I move right on top of these animals. I get right on top of them and really, really craft beautiful, beautiful results with that. So next I wanted to show you a few pictures in which I did just that. I used that little softbox and a remote trigger for both my large Nikon SLR, single lens reflex, and also a small Canon point and shoot camera. And I shot little migratory birds, tiny ones, that nest in Nebraska. And these pictures were all shot in Lancaster County, Nebraska, where I live. I wanted to, to kind of replicate the work of John James Audubon, one of my favorite wildlife artists of all time. He always painted the bird in its habitat. He wanted to show typical habitat for that animal. He was a storyteller, he really was. So first, the eastern bluebird, which is an animal that really likes to forage on the ground, and it likes short grass, and it likes people's gardens. So this is using the little softbox right on top of that animal, right on top, okay? Nice close perspective, right? The camera's triggered with a little device, that little radio trigger you saw in the demo. It fires the camera. I'm actually sitting in the car looking at the perch there where my light is with binoculars. You saw that in the, in the field shoot. Okay, what's next? Cliff swallow, look at this. With my cameras in place, by the way, 
the camera just becomes another perch to many of the birds that I've photographed. The camera's not moving, it just must look like a tree limb to them or something. It's often big and bulky right there, especially with the flash and softbox, but you know what? That's okay. I just really watch for a, a spot and an opportunity and I take a picture. And the result, it looks like we're right, we're right there living with these animals, and we are. Some of these are shot with a 14 and some with a 20 millimeter, some are shot with a 28. These are really wide, really close, and really in, intimate. In the case of these cliff swallows, they're very common. They nest in urban areas or under bridges, anywhere where they can be near flowing water. Here's one making its nest under a bridge. You can see the others foraging out there. They feed on, on insects a lot, mosquitoes. That's very critical because I want to give each image depth and a real sense of place. You know, most importantly, I want to show the type of habitat that each bird prefers. That's important for National Geographic. It's important to me. Next up, an interior leased tern. I go out with a tern and plover biologist for this, and I was with a cliff swallow biologist on the picture before, and she guided me to the right nest where the chicks weren't too vulnerable. I set my camera there very quickly, walked away. It's got a little radio trigger. We're right there with mom and her chicks. Uh, get it very, very quickly. Uh, this, one's, this one was a little harder to do, as you can imagine. The red-headed woodpecker. It's a bird that lives in deep forest. Here we're using a wide-angle lens on a nest cavity. Again, I'm working with a biologist. We determine how old the nest is, whether it's got chicks. We don't want to disturb things. We don't want to interrupt things. I always work with biologists that when we, we study the birds, we see where they are in their nest cycle. We don't want to do any harm. We just want to get our picture and go. We're using wide-angle lens. The light's very subtle. You can see there's a bird of the deep forest. That light's very subtle because that's that softbox again, and it's right there nest, next to the nest cavity. It's right there. We're using this quiet camera in this case, that little Canon G12, because it doesn't make very much noise. You can't even hear it go off. They can see the flash going off, but they tolerate it. The thing about all these is that they are close, well-lit, intimate, and you can see the context. You can see where we are. They're true environmental portraits. Now, how did I do this? Well, by now you've guessed it's nest sites or it's food, right? That's it. In the case of the red-bellied woodpecker here, this is actually one of the early attempts I had at this. You can actually see this is a, next to a feeder I have. I've drilled a couple of holes here and I put peanut butter suet in there. I just wanted to see if the technique would work and it did. They come right in, they want that food. This is just on that same farm where the thistles were. In all these cases, I also did my homework. I went to a local place in Lincoln called the Wild Bird Habitat Store, and I asked them, who's buying the most bird food? Who's the most avid feeder in the area, and what kind of birds do they like to bring in? What do they feed their birds the heaviest? Who feeds the most? The guy that owns the store, really great not guy, generous guy named Dave with lots of knowledge, he says, well, you want to go out and see Steve and Cheryl outside of town. They feed, they feed Baltimore Orioles slices of oranges and certain types of grubs during the mating season to really fatten these animals up for breeding. And they have tons of Orioles. Their birds are very habituated and come right up to their feeders. So I called Steve and Cheryl, I introduced myself, got permission to put my camera right out by their Oriole feeding station of oranges, and this resulted in what I think of as my favorite image. So this is, how, this is what we ended up with. The Baltimore Oriole is a bird of forest edge, basically. He likes forest edge where it breaks out into the open. There's a few, uh, there's a couple of geese with their babies on the lane there. How's this done? I want to show you how this is done. You'll be amazed. Look at this. That's the stuff. That's the rig. The softbox, the flash, the camera. There's an arm there that's basically supporting everything. That is a lot of stuff, isn't it? But look, he's hungry. He wants the orange. And there he is eating. And all that stuff yields this. A little deceptive, isn't it? But you know what? If you leave that gear there, the birds are, are hopping on it. There's lots of males they all want in, and they actually hop on it. And we left that rig there over a two and a half week time span. The birds know, and we put dummy cameras out too, so they really get used to it, and they know that this contraption won't harm them. I position it so it's shooting off to one side, so I don't see the feeder, I don't see the orange, and you know, there we go. There we go. That's how a lot of these are done. I compose the photos so that we've cropped out the food, obviously, and just shows the bird and the environment. Again, research and patience pays off. Each of these pictures, with the exception of the, of, let's say, the nests, these feeder pictures took about 40 hours a week to do. 40 hours over a week's time. It's a long time, maybe over two weeks' time. It takes a long time because 
you really want to set up the camera, go sit in a lawn chair from a great distance away, and you watch through binoculars, and you don't take any pictures till they come in and they're in a perfect position, it really takes a while. Patience pays in wildlife photography. In the case of the little Cameron, the Canon camera, that camera is virtually silent, by the way. It's a little G12. Doesn't bother the animals at all, and they don't notice the flash much. By the way, I made sure that Steve and Cheryl got a nice print or two as a thank you for helping me out. Follow up with a little print gift. You'll always be welcome back. That's a great way to do it. Another way to shoot wildlife is with camera traps where you don't even have to be there. Camera traps send out an infrared pulse and the animal takes its own picture. Let me show you a couple of these. Camera traps. I ran these in Africa uh, on assignment for National Geographic in Uganda. They're a nice way of getting something intimate and close. And again, the animal breaks an infrared beam. We put the camera on a mud hole or a, or a game trail and we really get some lovely pictures like this. Um, hyena at a den. How about that? This is a camera trap set up in uh, Medicine Hat, Alberta, in Canada for pronghorn antelope. There's the camera, there's the receiver, there's a little trail there. The, these animals, the pronghorn, like to crawl under it. We do remote cameras all the time. It's kind of pricey, but you do get some lovely pictures. I want to show the, offense, the effect of fence on these animals. A barbed wire fence is kind of hard on them, and our caption said, Man, if you raise that bottom strand to 18 inches and put a smooth wire there, that's easier for animals. That's much easier for them to navigate. So trying to make a point out of these pictures, trying to get some education into the magazine as well. That's what National Geographic's great at. Now, if you're visiting an area that's unfamiliar to you, especially a foreign area, I'd consider hiring a guide or taking a guided tour. I've had a number of wonderful guides over the years. I call them fixers because they fix my problems. It's amazing how much time and money they can save you, especially if they also happen to be local wildlife photographers. They know where to go, they know the best times of the year, and they know what the shooting restrictions are. Another nice thing about hiring an assistant is a lot of time, you spend so much time with that person, you often become friends with them for life. All the people you're seeing here, I'm still in touch with them. Many years later, whether it's Brazil or Africa or Bolivia, all these people become fast friends because you go through a lot with them. They're excellent people, they're fun hanging out with, and they know and care about nature and they save you a ton of time. Okay, Common mistakes, don't harass your subjects in the wild. I'll say it again, do not harass your subjects. Most, most states have laws and federal laws that really hammer you if you force animals to abandon their nests or young if you press them. You do not want to do that, it's not the right thing to do. Shoot these animals in the right way with some respect allow them to have their picture taken doing the things that they do, show them looking well and fine and behaving normally. Um, besides that, do you really want pictures of animals running away? I don't think so. Fighting, sleeping, feeding, playing, mating, that's what you want. You don't want pictures of animals that run away. That isn't it. And it's just wrong. And it doesn't make good pictures. So if you can't figure out how to do it, don't go. Do your homework. It is not worth making a bird abandon its nest or a deer abandon its fawn because you're trying to get a good picture. We're just talking about pictures after all. It ain't life and death, okay? Use big glass, long lens, remotes, wide open apertures. Make sure that, that uh, background goes very soft. You don't need too much depth of field in a really busy place. Another common mistake when shooting wildlife is being too far away. You can't get close to, any, to everything, but you can certainly get close to a lot of things, especially the small stuff, frogs, turtles, insects, flowers. Flowers can't hop away. They stay right there, totally captive audience. Your flower pictures should be among your best. So get close. Just like with people, intimate, repeated access to your subject is what's really needed. That's what makes it sing. Figure out a legal way, like setting up a bird feeder, that you can put a camera next to where you can get an intimate picture of that animal in the wild. Okay, your assignment. Shoot a nice intimate photo of any species of animal. No plant pictures on this one, no pets. Okay, too easy. Try to get the animal close enough so that it reads easily and fills a good portion of the frame. The animal can be captive or wild, exotic or native. Once you've tried out wildlife photography, by the way, you'll realize it's a lot harder than it looks, but it is so fun and satisfying when you finally nail it. People will, be in, will just be absolutely amazed. In our next lecture, we're gonna talk about photographing even more complex and difficult subjects, people. Come right back.